This program is run through a cooperation between the New Mexico Humanities Council and the League of Women Voters in the state of New Mexico. The Humanities Council received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and it had a very good commemoration connected with it. That grant is meant to honor the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, which is still about a year away, but it's meant for every state in the union to spend some time, and he started in October of 2021, thinking about just what your event has talked about, roots and routes, how the nation was founded, how the nation has grown, and taking some good time to exchange views, exchange thoughts, people tell their stories, and think about how our democracy started and how it's going now. Every state has their own way of doing this within New Mexico. Right now, possibly on Zoom, you'll have people from central New Mexico, which would be Albuquerque and their immediate area around them, people from southern New Mexico, Las Cruces, and areas around that, and northern New Mexico, which is where Santa Fe is. Each of those regions has their own League of Women Voters. Each of those regions is connected to the Humanities Council. And we are especially happy to be here in Edgewood. Irene is especially happy to be here in Edgewood. I visited here trying to make connections. And the way I made those connections, I met Linda, was my first acquaintance. Actually, I only met you on the phone. It's amazing, Linda, trust me. Um, I met her on the phone when I first drove down. I, I started in some place that was next to the local paper that sold tea because I couldn't find any people. And so I headquartered myself there and was lucky enough to find Linda. And Linda found Leota from the paper. And Leota found Andrea, the director of the library. So this is our Edgewood, New Mexico Listens team. The team that has come down from Santa Fe is my partner who does the design of flyers. She does our technology. She keeps us up to date on everything we have to do with the grant. I'm a talker, so I talk. Um, she calls me the scout because I'm willing to go places I've never been and talk to people I don't know. Um, I've had very good luck with that in my life, which has been pretty long by now. And Edgewood was certainly a highlight for me. Today, this meeting will be run and facilitated by Edgewood folks. It's going to be run by Linda and by Andrea. So after I talk, I'll talk to you again at the very end. But first, we're going to start with a bit of an intro from Andrea. Whoops, and right before that, I'm letting you know that this session is being recorded. One of the conditions of our grant is that we record everything that we're doing. The entity that holds those recordings is the New Mexico Council for the Human the New Mexico Humanities Council. For all of you, that recording will be available for you to take a look at on New Mexico Humanities Council, nmhc.org. So if you're interested, you can share the recording with family and friends. That's been, that will be for all of the sessions that we're running. We've done two up in Santa Fe. One was by a gentleman who had been the state historian to get us started out with stories. The second one was called Santa Fe Stories You've Never Heard. And if you get a chance to go up there, it's true. You've never heard the stories of these folks. We're not telling stories of famous politicians or famous public figures. We're talking and listening to the folks who live all around the state of New Mexico. And I'm gonna look at Rican, whom I consider the brains of the operation. I'm called the scout because I find people. Have I left anything out, Rican? Okay, and I'm going to turn over the talk now to Andrea. Do you want this mic? Sure. It's really nice. Well, I just wanted to say good morning. I'm so happy to see everybody here in person and online. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, my name is Andrea Corbin. I'm the Library Operations Manager for the Edgewood Community Library with the Town of Edgewood. 
And we are so very excited to be part of this program and we hope to continue these community forums or any type of conversations within our community. I think they're very important. We wanna hear your stories and we're glad you're attending today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Miss Linda here. I'll let her do a quick little introduction and get some housekeeping going. And I'm going to sit while I talk because um, standing that long kills me. So I'm Linda Burke. I run the local Chamber of Commerce here in Edgewood for the East Mountain region. And um, this has been a fun project to work on. Leota Harriman with The Independent is not able to be here today, but they are also a co-supporter of this event. So I did want to say that we, as uh, Irene mentioned, we have people that are participating online. And we have people here that are in the room. So as we go through today's program, we're going to alternate back and forth between people that are in person and people that are online to share stories. And we have asked everyone to put their dot on the map over here so we get an idea of where everyone is from. And um, whether that be the place they were born or whatever they consider their hometown. And uh, hopefully everybody got a name tag. And you should have in a packet a program that looks like this. On the inside, um, we've got some information on how today is going to flow, along with some just curious questions about Edgewood for people that are new that might not know. We'll figure, uh, we'll ask the group if they are, have the knowledge to fill those in. And um, that's about it. So we're actually going to start today with a short video, since we are talking about some of the deep roots and history of this region. Um, if I could have Debbie Pogue from Retro 66 just come up and intro the video. Don't mean to put you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the video was put together by Roger Holden, who is the past president of Retro 66. And Retro 66 is a 501c3 that was formed, oh gosh, almost 10 years ago. Wow. Um, it was a combination of people from Edgewood, Moriarty, and to Harris. Uh, we were asked by the current mayors uh, or then current mayors to um, come together to form a group that basically would help to enhance the life of East Mountain residents along the Route 66 corridor. And um, we feel like We've done that through events, through education, through tiny little economic development plays. Um, and Roger is our magnificent videographer and um, he has put together uh, a video uh, called Hannett's Tale, which is really how this part of New Mexico sort of came to flourish when Route 66 was rerouted through Moriarty and Edgewood to Harris and on into Albuquerque and hmm? oh that's right no one knows the ending <laughs> but it's a great little video we're so proud of Roger and thank you for coming thanks thanks Debbie so if we could roll that video um hello i'm roger holden with retro 66 a route 66 revitalization project whose mission is to enhance the quality of life of east mountain residents through economic development along the route 66 corridor i'm here to tell you about hannah's joke or as we say in retro retribution road Few today are aware that a portion of Route 66 through New Mexico was originally christened Hannett's Joke, conceived in the vision and sense of humor by one of New Mexico's most controversial trial lawyers and politicians, Arthur T. Hannett, New Mexico governor from 1924 to 1926. Hannett's Joke had its origins in the bitter 1926 gubernatorial election campaign between Hannett, the incumbent, and the challenger, Richard Dillon of Encino. Before 1926, there was no direct route east from Albuquerque to Santa Rosa or vice versa. What few roads existed were more accustomed to the tread of feet and hooves rather than rubber tires. If you were driving west from Santa Rosa to Albuquerque, there were only two graded and serviced roads. 
The northern route went through Santa Fe to Albuquerque. The southern route went through Mountain Air to Los Lunas and ending in Albuquerque. Challenger Dick Dillon's profitable sheep sharing and meat production operation in Encino was one of his glowing qualifications to be governor. In 1926, located as it was on a major east-west route, Encino was a prosperous community. After a hard fought campaign on November 2nd, 1926, Richard Dillon wrestled the office of governor from Hannett. Dillon became the new governor. Hannett wasn't about to let this upstart merchant of Encino and member of the Santa Fe ring, a group of attorneys and landowners who used their power and wallets to smear Hannett have the last word. In November, 1926, Hannett summoned his highway engineers to the governor's office and placed before them a map of New Mexico. According to legend, the, with ruler and pen in hand, Hannett drew a straight line from Moriarty to a portion of the Romero Highway, just north of Santa Rosa. On that route, beginning December 1st, 1926, Governor Hannett told his engineers to survey, cut, scrape, and grade a 69-mile highway before his gubernatorial term ended on January 1st, 1927. The new highway would eliminate the need for travelers between Albuquerque and all points east to ever again pass through Romeroville and Santa Fe to the north or Encino to the south. A faster, easier route meant more traffic and more business for Albuquerque and New Mexico, but it spelled doom for the future of Encino. By December 1st, 1926, state highway engineers in Moriarty and Santa Rosa organized their highway crews at the respective beginnings to the new US Route 66. The two crews were to join each end of the new Route 66 at Palma, later to be called Client's Corners. The equipment operators of the State Highway Department were eager to participate in Hannah's joke. They fully expected the end of their own jobs and careers, along with Governor Hannett's on January 1, 1927, the scheduled date for the inaugural ceremony for the new governor, Richard Dillon. The math was simple. 31 days, including Christmas Day, to construct 69 miles of highway. The race was on. Men with red flags marked the path of least resistance to the pinion forest, tying cables to the pinion woods with tractors were yanked out roots and all. The roads were then cut with rough graders followed by finishing tractors and graders. Both crews historically endured the bitter December cold with the misery of wind and snows on the Eastern Plains. Fences were cut down as the crews raced to Palma. Surprisingly, without the benefit of a formal process of condemnation, not a single landowner sued to stop the construction of the road between Moriarty and Santa Rosa. They probably appreciated the economic development of having a major highway run through their land. Nonetheless, there were some who bitterly opposed the new road. According to the engineer's report, suspects from the little towns of Romeroville, Encino, and Vaughan sabotaged equipment at night, pouring sugar into gas tanks and sand into engines. To protect their equipment, the loyal crews took to sleeping around their road equipment. On January 1, 1927, Governor Richard Dillon was sworn into office. That same day, he sent his engineer to Palma to put an end to Hannett's joke. As the result of a snowstorm, he did not find the highway crews until January 3rd. By that time, the crews had already met in Palma, completing a usable, if rough, road of 69 miles destined to become the new US Route 66. Like the happy end of a typical Hollywood movie, instead of firing the employees of the highway department for sealing the fate of Encino, Governor Dillon honored their accomplishment and enthusiasm by keeping every one of them in the state's employment with orders to continue improvements to the crude road. Realizing the value of keeping the voters in New Mexico's most populous city happy with their new highway. In the end, Governor Dillon recognized that Hannah's joke was a product of vision that would benefit us all. Ultimately, both the Joker and his victim shared the last laugh. Fosto San Bernardino, won't you get here to this family tip? When you make, when you make, make that California trip. Get your kicks on the Get your kicks on Route 66. Get your kicks on Route 66. So that's a little bit of history of how Route 66 came to be through our region. I think it also 
shows you some of the heritage of the people that lived here and their grit and determination to get stuff done. I don't think that that has changed a whole lot, uh, especially in Edgewood. Um, we still have a lot of people working real hard to make things happen here, uh, volunteers and so forth, and it's great. So now what I'd like to do is move to the, the section where we get to share stories, where the audience gets to tell a little bit about their roots or um, their, it, I'm sorry, or their coming to Edgewood. So I'd like to start with some of the people that we are going to call long timers here, uh, whether you've whether you're young and you've lived here your whole life or you're older and you've lived here your whole life or you've just lived here for a long, long time, um, this is your group. This is your chance to share your stories. And I would like to um, ask a person who I know was born here and lived here a long time, Rita Loy Simmons, if you wouldn't tell us because you probably have the earliest story um, and we're going to ask everyone to kind of try and keep it to about a minute or so, so that everybody gets a chance to share. So, okay. Um, yes, I. I was born uh, near Gallup at Rehoboth Mission, and my mother and dad brought me home to the family homestead at mile marker four on uh, north of Edgewood, where there still remains a foundation of the house. When it thawed in the spring, it was a bad, bad winter. So my life became, began on a farm. I can remember the cow kicking me into the manure, and I've spent my lifetime trying to avoid the manure. But my uh, dad and, and his family were farmers who had come from Missouri and Kentucky, um, their parents had, to homestead in 1907 and 1908. And at the, from the very beginning, farmers had to find another way to finance their farming and ranching habits and to um, prove the claim of their property. And of course, we went to schools. There was no um, electricity and the roads were, were bladed at least every other year at election time. So I've seen this land go from a lamplight every three miles to cross-country traffic at 75 miles an hour and the growth of Edgewood. And my parents were poor, dumb farmers that didn't know what they couldn't do. So they did it. Thanks, Rita Loy. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with Rita Loy, that may be from another place watching online, Rita Loy is also a former town counselor for the town of Edgewood. And when she says that her parents didn't know what they couldn't do. They are responsible for helping to bring water to this community and gas lines to this community and electricity. Um, and these were not things that happened many, many, many decades ago. <laughs> these were things that happened like in the 60s and 70s, correct? And so when other places had long since had all of those utilities, Edgewood, that was new. And that's one of the things that helped this town grow. So who else would consider themselves a long timer that would like to share a story? Martha, Ray, Jerry, Debbie. Do we have someone online? Great. Are they a long timer? Well, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the meantime, you came, you might as well speak. Come on. I'm Martha Eden, and I've lived in the East Mountain since 1978. Um, that was the year I got together with Chet Eden, and we uh, got married and raised horses and kids here. His parents had actually come here by horse-drawn wagon in 1914, and they saw the trees, and they said, wow, there must be water. So they homesteaded in what was now then called Barton where there was a motel and a school, uh, which is now there's only ruins and a pasture. 
Um, they had 180 acres. <clears throat> um, he had an aunt and uncle who dry land farmed 1,000 acres of pinto beans north of what is now I-40 between Sedeo Hill and Edgewood. Um, Howard Calkins remembers uh, Chet and his family and his uh, real, rather brilliant grandfather who was from Wales originally. And Grandpa Jones had actually invented carboholic miners lanterns when he was in Kansas, but he was a horrible businessman, so he never made a dime. <laughs> he did take, and Howard Calkins remembers this, he, he took a straight 12 engine from a Rio and tried to incorporate it into his tractor because he was a mechanical genius. And he did finally get it to work, but he had a hell of a tractor. He also had a, um, a conveyor belt driven uh, sawmill, which is just north of where Sedeo Hill Road turns into a dirt road and connects 217 and old 66. Uh, so this, they had a dugout in that <clears throat> portion. They had another, I think, 80 acres north of that road. And they had a dugout there, which Chet remembered when he was a kid, that it was very warm in the winter, very cool in the summer. And when Grandma, Grandma Jones needed more cabinet space, she just dug it out of the dirt. <laughs> and so, so he built, uh, having been a builder for all of his life after he got started in life, um, he built an underground house, which is still there on Cedillo Road. You can see it from the spur road that goes between 217 and 66. When we moved out in 1978, uh, Dinkle was still a dirt road. 217 was a dirt road. Uh, Howard Calkins remembers all these things, and he gave me a 1940s um, voter roll from what was called Otto. And I think that was the original name before it was Venus. I think it was Otto. And you so you see the names Mosley and Madol and all the names that our streets are named. All those families lived in. Everybody worked on the farmer farm at that point. That was the main source of employment in the 40s. So, hmm? I'm sorry. OK, sure. That's enough. <laughs> OK. All right, so we're going to go to one of our online participants now, K.R. Scott. Uh, my name is K.R. Scott, and I'm a native Southwesterner, having lived big chunks of my life in California, Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. And my connection with New Mexico actually began with my mother, who was from Oklahoma, when she married her first husband in a little town called Lovington, and later then moved to Roswell where she spent the 40s and 50s in Roswell doing all kinds of things, like being one of the first women in New Mexico to fly a plane. Uh, she then left New Mexico, found my father, who was a crazy French Cajun, and uh, I was born in Albuquerque. My mother loved to travel, so we left New Mexico a bit after I was born, came back for high school, finished up at Roswell High, ooh, coyotes, and then went off to Eastern, where I met the love of my life, who was from Santa Fe. She loved trees, and I loved the plains. So after I served a term in the Army and spent a lot of time in the Middle East, which made me really appreciate the plains of Mexico, I uh, became a high school teacher in Phoenix. And then when I retired, I was prepared to come back home. And my wife, when she retired, said, we are going back home. So we came back home and we looked all over the place. We found one town which met our needs. She needed mountains and trees, and I needed to be able to see more than 15 miles. So we have settled here in Edgewood and have loved it ever since because this town gives us the small town feeling of New Mexico, which we both love. I'm seeing some themes here where people leave and then they come back. Did you leave? Why, why did you come back? Or if you've been here for a really long time, um, what kind of ways did you gather with the community? I think those things would be fun to hear as well. Okay, I didn't know if anybody else wanted to go. Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> Thanks, I'm, I'm kind of a new old timer. Uh, I was born in Albuquerque, but I, 
I bought property in Edgewood to retire on in about 1979, paid it off 15 years later. And uh, I, by that time, everybody had kind of moved in around me. So I wanted more space. I went to Moriarty, bought a farm, lived there for 22 years. And I realized um, in about 1998, uh, Santa Fe County tried to implement a new rule that would make 90% of all private property in the county open space, public open space. So the farmers, the ranchers, the landowners didn't like it. We organized, and one of the things we did is talk to Edgewood some of my friends in Edgewood and said, you ought to really incorporate because you'll have autonomy. You can make your own rules. You can actually have grocery stores, which you couldn't have at the time. So that happened. And I realized years later that I could move to Edgewood from Moriarty, have all the conveniences of the services that had developed as a result of incorporation. So it, for me, it's the perfect mix. Uh, the small town feel with all the services that you really need without having to drive all the way from Moriarty where I was into Albuquerque. So that's kind of a leave and come back kind of thing, I think. All right, thanks, Jerry. And for those of you that don't know, Jerry was recently elected to our town commission. Um, do, do we have someone else online maybe that's a long timer? No, Ray? You uh, yeah, I'm Ray Siggers and I'm in the real estate business here. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. And after the Vietnam War and after too much time in a big city, I decided to look around for a smaller town with better hunting and fishing. Um, <clears throat> so I hit an opportunity with some Atlanta investors who had land in Edgewood, New Mexico and agreed to come out here and get their land developed, which we did. So we've developed pretty much everything south of Interstate 40 and about six different subdivisions down there. And I did it as a consultant and I didn't own the land, but I started a real estate company simultaneously. So I've been here 48 years altogether. And the welfare of this town, I've raised four kids, so I really wanted to see it maintained as an area of slightly larger lots and not such a dynamic urban center that everything turns into. So we've been fighting for those principles um, for as long as I've been here. Uh, Jerry here was with me when we fought Santa Fe County tooth and claw for many years and some of the land use things they were trying to implement. But anyway, um, I've been a real estate broker the entire time. I haven't left because I'm a broker. I was too broke to leave, I guess. But uh, <laughs> but we really love this town and we love the area and we want to maintain what we've got. Thanks, Ray. Um, so I definitely think that we, we definitely hear a theme here. Um, people in Edgewood seem to not like to take what they're told. They do things about problems and they talk about problems and they take action. So there's another theme I think that, that we're seeing. Um, so I guess at this point, what I'd like to do too is open it up to, um, oh, hang on, Marie Lois coming back up. I was at that land use meeting too. And I was asked if I had anything to say and I couldn't think of anything. And one of the older family members, uh, Joe Anaya, asked me to speak. So finally, it occurred to me to say to those county commissioners uh, in the midst of 200 or more residents of the Edgewood area, if you want to get people's attention, scare hell out of them. And you have. At the end of the meeting, one of the commissioners got up and said, well, you got our attention, too. So this is the power of government and groups and grassroots. Now, I'll give you a little more history of the development in the area. After World War II, my dad had been home and had a dairy uh, because he was a married man, but he liked to share information and he was teaching the latest farming, ranching and welding techniques to the returning veterans who then said, well, we can't weld, we don't have electricity. And dad had heard about REA. So he went to Bill King, Bruce, the governor, Bruce King's father, and they formed an ad hoc committee with a Jerry, Jared, I'm sorry, 
Gerald Simmons, no relation to my late husband. And they approached REA about a generating plant down by Corona. So the word comes back that there's a group in Encino, Vaughn, and Mountain Air trying to do the same thing. They'd better join forces. And my dad uh, became the project manager to have the system built. And he said he and his crew did everything from sweeping the floors to getting the right-of-way easements, putting up the poles, and putting the wire in. Dad could speak a little Spanish, so he could speak to the uh, people along the face of the Manzano Mountains who primarily spoke Spanish. The, um, then after the job was finished and the wire was electrified all the way to Sandia Knowles, the, he was offered the permanent job, but he preferred farming and ranching, so he tried it in Moriarty, and he rented some fields, but the cost of raising that water was prohibitive, and the drought had been so deep that the crops weren't good, so he went broke, and then he went into construction where he spent 15 years with the Presbyterian Board of National Missions. All the time, the ranch was in operation in so far as it could support itself. Running cattle, the bean farming had completely gone away. When he got back, people were beginning to spill out of Albuquerque looking for that wide open space that Ray spoken of and Jerry longed for in his heart. And um, he, he began to watch people move in, build homes and drill dry holes. And he had a, a, a stock line running about five miles from the ranch house down to um, what is now Mountain Valley Road and Los Leyendas. And one man came to him and he said, uh, you've got a pipeline of, of water on the north of my new house and I've drilled two dry holes. You've said this country needs a water system. I'm a lawyer and you're in business. So he built the Entrenosa water system. And in the same time, Howard Calkins was busy filling the needs of the land that Ray was selling. So between the farm folks, the infrastructure came to this area. And it's been kind of a rough road, a rocky road from time to time. I hang on to your hat and have a good time. Thank you, Rita Loy. I love hearing all the stories of the people that really came here first and started everything up that we're the beneficiaries of today. Um, but I would like to also hear some of the new stories. So some of the people that have come to Edgewood more recently that don't consider themselves long timers, doesn't matter how long you've been here, maybe you just came, maybe you've been here five years or even longer. If you don't, if you, if you, if you still consider yourself a newcomer, we'd like to hear some stories. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, that we have a couple of people attending virtually. I've recognized them as um, people that post regularly on Facebook and um, a couple of people have come in the library before, and I'm wondering if Eugene or uh, Evelyn, if you wanted to weigh in on this, we'd be, it would be nice to hear from you. Um, but we, I know we do have a couple of newcomers, um, and some of our facilitators are newcomers. And then Bonnie, who I met earlier, you're kind of a newcomer, even though you don't live here. It was very interesting hearing where you came from and um, growing up in uh, Santa Fe and uh, the other places you've been to. And you kind of had a similar theme where you went away and then came back. Um, would you be interested in sharing some of that? Uh, sure. Okay, let me get you. I, I know I put you on the spot. Okay, I'll grab you a mic. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking. Sure. Um... Yeah, so I live in downtown Santa Fe, um, and I came down here just to hear some stories, but I grew up in Santa Fe, left when I was about 17, uh, didn't appreciate the town or the city, 
because I was young and restless. So I moved to Oregon, moved to New York. I was gone for about, probably about 16 years and learned a lot, you know, traveled a lot, saw the world, but um, in just before the pandemic in 2020, I um, moved back here and have appreciated the area a lot more. Um, just been trying to understand the history here and talk to people, uh, things that I just did not get when I was younger. And describe a little bit about what you mean about things that you didn't like when you were younger. Sure, yeah, well. What do you mean by that? There's, uh, there's a lot of history here that I don't think I appreciated. It was a little bit dry for me. And I was looking for, you know, kind of romantic, big city life. Um, and it just took a little while for me to appreciate how many cultures there are here and how living, working people have, you know, made these communities and have long standing multi generational families here. And, um, yeah, so I've just been trying to get in touch with that. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be back. I appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Was there anyone else who wanted to weigh in? Um, anyone online? Miss Irene? No, no, no. Oh, Definitely not no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I didn't know if we wanted to hear from anyone else, if we wanted to give a little bit more time to any. Okay, I'll hand it back over to you. So Rakan, did you say yes or no, anyone online? Okay. Well, I'm sort of an in-between myself, actually. I'm not a long timer, I'm not a newcomer. Um, I've lived here two different times, actually, in my life, um, right after the town incorporated. And then I moved back in 2016. And uh, I ended up, and one of my questions was, how did people find it with those newcomers? Um, what brought you here? And actually for, for us, it was the school system because my husband was going to be working in Albuquerque and we wanted to be someplace where our kids would get a good education and the Albuquerque public schools were not the thing at the time. Moriarty Edgewood schools were better and that's what brought us to Edgewood. And um, we felt very at home very quickly. I learned the history of the community by looking at the road names, which are all named for a lot of the homesteading families and uh, got to meet some of the homesteading families like Rita Loy and hear even more stories. And it just fascinated me that Edgewood has these kind of very deep roots and that families are still here, that they've homesteaded here and that a lot of other new people keep moving here and finding Edgewood someplace. It's a town of 6,000 people. So it's an unusual thing for people to find us, but yet they do. And so it's been exciting. Uh -oh. Okay. I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and weigh in um, because I won't pass up a, um, an opportunity to talk about myself, obviously. But um, I guess uh, Rita Loy Simmons had asked to tell everyone about the Corvins. So I'm kind of in between. So I'm new, but the my husband's family is a longtime family. So they're originally from uh, Stanley. They came and settled in the Stanley area, which I don't know if you're not familiar with Edgewood and the surrounding East Mountain area. It's about Northeast of Edgewood. Um, and there is a Mesa out there called Row Mesa. And um, that is where my husband's family is from. So the Corvins have been around for a while and they have very deep roots in the community. And even though I've been here for about 30 years, I kind of do consider myself a long timer, but I'm a little bit of not a long timer. So um, we moved here. <laughs> my dad used to work for um, Hills Brothers and he was a sales representative for Nestle Beverage when they took them over. And we kind of traveled around, I'm originally from Tucson, moved to Texas, moved to Missouri, and then moved here. And um, I went to the local um, elementary schools here, middle school, high school, and college here. 
And so I consider this my longtime home, but um, there are so many things that as I continue on with my uh, relationship with my husband, there's so many things I didn't know about. And there are so many little secrets and details and things that you don't know unless you've been here for such a long time. And those, those are always exciting. But what is even more exciting is to view um, those types of experiences from a newcomer's perspective. And working in the library, I have immediate access to a lot of newcomers um, because we're a little bit of a community hub. When people move in, sometimes the first thing they look for are those community services. And we're a large community service. And so we get a lot of new people and it's lovely meeting new people and uh, seeing how, um, if you can tell that they're not kind of used to the casual nature of New Mexico. And then when they've been here for a couple of years, then they're a little bit more relaxed and they've settled into how things are done. And I'm glad that we have so many new people coming in right now. They offer so many different perspectives and different talents and resources to the community. And um, we, I, I want to be able to continue to bridge that gap and have kind of a marrying between the newcomers and the long timers. Cause I think we could come up with something really cool for Edgewood and really exciting. And um, this is why I'm so jazzed about this program. So I didn't know if anybody else wanted to weigh in. Okay, great. Let me, you got a mic? Okay. So Evelyn says she retired in October, 2014. I guess that makes her sort of a middle of the road person as well. Um, she came from Santa Clara County, California. She was in the social services agency. And then she began her journey to find a place to retire because California had become too expensive to live and too crowded. She visited Edgewood twice before making the decision to move here. Well, that's an interesting story. Was that Evelyn V? Elle McGarry, okay. Okay, just curious. <laughs> You know, it's such a small town. Everybody does tend to know a lot of people here and that's kind of fun. Um, so some of the other questions that we are wondering about is not only what brought people to Edgewood, but what made you decide to settle here, to stay here, to, to purchase a home or rent a home or just put some roots down in Edgewood? Does anybody want to share on that one? When, when I was a kid, my dad was in the army. So we crossed the United States every two years. It seemed like the army would send us off different places and then back to the East Coast. So we crossed New Mexico at least five times before I was 15 on Route 66. And I kept seeing horses and I always wanted a horse. My dad said, no, we can't afford a horse. And I'd say, look, there's a shack there with a horse. They, I know they don't have as much money as we do. <laughs> And he, we never got horses, but I did finally get a bunch of them when I came to New Mexico. But that, I think, um, one of the appeals of Edgewood, it's a great place to, to ride, to raise horses, to, there's so much open space still, even though we've grown enormously in the last 40 years. Um, and I think that's a, a major part of Edgewood's appeal is the equine community. Absolutely. I, I'm not a horse person but I have enjoyed very much watching all my neighbors that have horses. So I get the benefit of watching them without the work. It's perfect. Go ahead, Rakan, who's next? I have a question here or a suggestion. How about talking about ways that rural people and urban people can work together more productively since there seems to be a real gap in understanding? Thanks, Meredith. Okay, um, well, since we're all kind of rural people here. I guess we're going to have to pick our brains a little bit and figure that out. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Anybody in this room that's lived in a bigger city? Okay, there you go. So everybody chose to come to a small town from a bigger place. So maybe, maybe we start that process by asking what appealed to you about the small town after having lived in a big city? I've been a licensed realtor for 45 years, not quite as long as Ray. Um, however, 
in my experience, I find people are disenchanted with where they are, so they come to make a change. The clash happens because they bring their past with them. And it's hard to read, to adjust to a slower and more rural lifestyle and attitude. The people who've already got their roots here are established, have their habits, and their habits and their views are being um, changed by people coming. I was on a board of directors of the Intranosa water system, and one day uh, one of the directors said, Ritaloy, let's do this, this, and this. And I said, oh, that's a good idea, except they're related and they're feuding. Oh, well, let's do this, this, and this. Oh, gee, another good idea. We're related and we're feuding. He said, oh, you don't need the map out here. You need the genealogy chart. And it's true. This really is cousin country. However, as a realtor, it's our job to help people uh, understand a little bit about the area and help them get involved. Because once you invest your time and energy into a project or a place, you become involved. And the neighbors began to appreciate your efforts in their behalf, and they will reciprocate equally. I have one comment here, and then uh, KR, KR wants to talk again, so it'll take us one second to hook him in. But uh, um, Evelyn, Evelyn says, uh, listen, understand, and work with people instead of, of against them. And I'll try and get KR. Am I back? Um, <laughs> I don't live in... I don't live in Edgewood, but I live in Moriarty and in Albuquerque. Uh, we moved here from just outside of San Francisco. And um, I found that I felt most welcome and most productive as a community member when I was asked to participate um, with the Lodgers Tax Board, with Retro 66, um, Different ideas aren't always bad. <laughs> and we, we all get entrenched and now I feel like I'm an old timer. Um, uh, and somebody new comes in and says, well, let's do it this way. And everybody goes, we've tried that. Sometimes you can try things two times, three times, a million times. And then it works because the people keep changing. So, and sometimes, over that course of a million tries, people's hearts and minds change as well. So I think staying open as a community and remembering that, yeah, we all moved here for the big wide open spaces and not a ton of people. I moved here because I came with my husband um, and just sort of inherited this I like lots of people <laughs> in small city spaces, but I see that um, just, just remembering that people are there because they want to be. And that's kind of nice to know that somebody else thought you had a great idea. You were first, they moved in. That doesn't make them bad. That, that means that, gosh, you might have done something right. So let's share it, share the space. It really isn't yours anyway. So it can make that little tiny space you think you have a lot better. All right, now we're gonna switch over to KR, who's an online participant. Am I there? Hello? Hello? <laughs> okay do you hear me now yes okay good uh that that was an interesting question it, it is one that my wife and i have really worked on since we moved here uh when i left active duty we were in phoenix arizona 
and uh, I became a high school teacher. So we lived there. And the area we lived in Phoenix was uh, originally away from uh, the area of Phoenix. It was actually a small subdivision on the far southwest corner. The town of Phoenix grew up around us. And there were advantages. You had a restaurant on every corner. You had all kinds of services that were out 24 hours a day. But you didn't have any space. Our house had a small yard. Uh, even though we'd lived there for 31 years, all our neighbors had moved in and out. And we didn't really get to know them because Phoenix is too darn hot to be outside very often. So when my wife retired, we knew we wanted to come home. We both loved New Mexico more than anything else. The big question was where to settle. Uh, my wife, being a Santa Fe girl, wanted to move back to Santa Fe. Uh, being retired teachers, Santa Fe wasn't an option for us. I wanted to get a double wide in the middle of the desert. That didn't satisfy my wife. So when we ended up here, when our real estate agent brought us out here, we had never thought of anything on the other side of the mountain. Because to be honest with you, when I lived in uh, Portales and Roswell, Edgewood didn't really exist. It was just a Stuckey's that anybody thought about before going into Albuquerque. When we came out here and saw that there was more than a Stuckey's, we sort of lost, we sort of felt bad for the Stuckey's being gone. But we were really impressed with the way Edgewood had developed and had taken the risk to develop over other towns in our area. We both found that the difference between city living and country living is, are miles apart. And there are people who move here with the expectation the water will taste good. <laughs> uh, that's not necessarily always the case. Uh, there were people who expected there'd be services on Sunday when we came out here with our son. Our son said, oh, I want to get some uh, alcoholic beverages and went to Smith's on Sunday. And of course, at that point, they didn't sell alcoholic beverages on Sunday. Uh, Pizza Barn was the best thing we had in town for that. But the flip side is that Edgewood has a character. It's an interesting fusion, just like the whole state of New Mexico is. We're not all one thing or another. We're a blend of so many different things. And I love this town. We immediately got involved in things. We got involved in the Lions Club and then we got involved in our homeowners association by accident. And then I was asked to join the park and recs committee and I got to be a member and then it stopped. I think it stopped because of me, you know, having me around scares people. But the neat part was that now working with the park and recs committee, I can see so much potential for Edgewood for our citizens. And I'm not interested in recruiting one more person to move to Edgewood. But at the same time, if it helps the community, I'm not against one more person moving to Edgewood. So I think we have a beautiful place here. And I hope we never forget that New Mexico is largely made of small towns like Edgewood. And we really are the, the, the place where New Mexico spirit comes from. Albuquerque may be impressive and is a great neighbor. It has everything we could ever want. But the reality is this is New Mexico, not that. Thank you, KR. That was an interesting perspective also. I think it's really a lot of fun, and I saw a comment come up. Rakan, if you want to read, um, I couldn't quite read the whole thing, but I believe it was from Evelyn. It is from Evelyn. I met community members through volunteering on my local HOA, Homeowners Association Board, and also at the Edgewood Community Garden with the local Edgewood Senior Center. And I do think that that's a very common theme here, especially in a small town. People wear a lot of hats that they um, tend to meet other community members by getting involved. You see the same faces oftentimes on various different committees around town. In a larger city, I don't really think it's that different. I just think that you may not cross the same paths with people as much because there are so many more people to volunteer on those committees. Um, Irene, do you want to share your perspective as a Santa Fe person, or, or I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Would you like to? Yeah. Oh, just as a large city comparison um, to, that was my thought anyway. Either of you? Okay. Oh my goodness. Um, I suppose I was born in New York City and grew up in the metropolitan area of New York. So I was raised as an urban child. But before I say anything else, I'll have to say that part of my interest in Edgewood was selfish in the beginning. I also, while I was in graduate school, worked as a waitress in a little town called Silverton, Colorado, 
which had about 800 people. It's changed a great deal since I was there. I was there in the 70s, but I loved it there. Um, I've, I've already begged Andrea to talk to me about running a library in a small town because though totally unqualified, I was the librarian of Silverton, Colorado for two years, completely unqualified. But I think the difference I see in that was the person to person contact. It, and maybe it'll sound sappy and silly to you, but I'm happy when I come to Edgewood. I was happy when I came to Edgewood and knew zero people here. Um, I'm good at cold calls. I'm good at, if I get curious, I'll actually drive. I drove here. I couldn't find anything. I was looking for the paper. I found the physical location, but I couldn't find Leota. She was, of course, now I realize she's the owner and the editor. She was way too busy to be sitting at a desk waiting for Irene to come by. But then I went to a little tea shop next to that. And Edgewood, you let a person that you've never, the people that I met, they never met me. I had no bona fides. I suppose I had a driver's license, but people were so welcoming. And the person to person and the intuition that often comes with a small town person, like people will say that New Yorkers are savvy and they know this and they know that. We don't know anything really. There's millions of us. But in Edgewood, you have some kind of intuition. I, maybe I was flattered because you didn't think I was a criminal, but you didn't. People talked to me, they helped me. That's how I met Linda. And how New Mexico Listens came here was out of that little tea shop and not being able to find Leota. And this is what grew from that. So I think there's something about small towns that it makes things happen. It just makes things happen. People are surprised by that. They think, oh, you're just a little town, New York. That's where they know. I'm a New Yorker. That's not true. Thank you, Irene. Do we have anyone else online? In the meantime, I'll hand the mic to Jerry. So I think uh, Mr. Scott really articulated this very well. Uh, I hear this all the time and, the, and I'm advocating for the commission to hold a town hall meeting much like this uh, sometime this spring in order to really talk about what it is that people value about Edgewood and what they wanna preserve about it. I know I remember Ronald Reagan said that uh, people can vote with their feet and they oftentimes do. When I was uh, trying to build my career, I opened an office in Denver and had a house there for several years in order to build my business. And it was a totally different environment, a totally different feel. I wasn't focused on quality of life as much as I was on building my business. So that happens oftentimes. Uh, young people will move to a big city in order to take advantage of the economic opportunity, the educational opportunities. And then when it, they focus more on quality of life, I think they choose differently. So I certainly did. And uh, I know a lot of people have, and I've heard from many constituents, we don't want Edgewood to become Rio Rancho which is a totally different kind of environment. So I think it's important that we focus on what it is we can, what people really value here about the quality of life, how we can add to that and how we can preserve what we already have. Um, it doesn't preclude economic growth. It doesn't preclude uh, growth of the population, which is going to happen, but we can still preserve what we love about this place uh, while that happens. And I think that's the, the focus for me. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Do we have someone up? Okay, we'll do an online person. So this is a, a question from Michelle. It's actually two questions. How do people define community and what is the relationship between identity and community? Anybody want to answer that? Could you repeat the question? Sure. How do people define community and what is the relationship between identity and community? Wow. <laughs> you have to grow into either one of them. <laughs> yeah, it, it's experiencing new things and being willing to, um, to greet a neighbor that you don't know. The post office is a great place for smiles, and there's a lot of them. And after a while, you get to talk to somebody you smiled at. But that's what it is, is breaking ice. 
Now, what I want to <clears throat> address was why was the name changed? And uh, Um, I'm not sure, but Venus was the place that my father's birth certificate states. And Venus was a, a mercantile company on Venus Road. And the gentleman got won the bid for the post office. And the post office was a political appointment. So if you had a, a, a store and you could put in a post office there and you were politically correct, uh, connected, you got to name all the mail that came to the region by your post office. Venus was the name of his, his daughter. And so my father and um, had, there were five in the family. Two were born in higher, one, uh, two were born in Venus and one was born in Helwig. And that's where the post office moved, as well as Barton, and then eventually to Edgewood because of the edge of the woods. So that's how the names changed and moved around. It wasn't where a town was, but where the post office had been won by a local merchant. The same is true of Moriarty and um, uh, Eventually, the two towns will grow together, just like all of the others, because people will still find it enchanting. And once they're able to drop their past history and the way it was done at home and decide to try a new route, then they will put down their roots. Thank you. OK, let's put KR up. Can you hear me? Now, can you hear me? Hello? Leave computer audio. No, I want computer audio, yes. You do? Got it, got you. Okay, thank you. That, the idea of identity and community is a really good question. I have a neighbor that I talked to. She's from South Carolina. And she moved here because her husband was assigned out here. He's a service member. And I was talking to her because a lot of time in the army, I was stationed down South. And so I sort of understood her and we started talking about Southern traditions and things like that. And I asked her, so how do you like Edgewood? She said, oh, it's beautiful, but it's not home. And I asked her, well, why, what makes South Carolina so much better than Edgewood? And she said, well, I miss my family and I like humidity. Well, she's the first person I've met who actually says they like humidity. But she really got me to thinking. And I thought, well, is there anything we can do for her? She said, no, the people are here are, are as friendly as they are in South Carolina. And the schools are great. And everything here, our house is nice. But it just doesn't have the feeling of home. So her identity will always be tied to South Carolina, no matter where she is. And that's one of the big problems when people especially move out of state, when they come here, they have that identity and try to ask them to join us. I've always considered myself a New Mexican, no, no matter where I lived in the world. But people coming from out of the area, out of the state, uh, sometimes even out of the country here, we have a different view of the world, a very different view of the world than a lot of places have. And so that identity thing, how do you fuse somebody's identity from a, being an urbanite or being a Chicagoan or anything else and match it with the identity of being an Edgewoodian and a New Mexican, that's a big challenge. But I think the one thing that goes for us that doesn't necessarily work everywhere else is that we are sort of friendly. You may not always like the people we're, we talk to, but I've never had anybody not say hi to me. And I wave at people in my car when I'm going down the road and they wave right back. And that makes me feel good here, because in Phoenix, usually it wasn't a whole hand that was in the air when people passed by each other. <laughs> so it, uh, it, that's a tough issue, it really is. But I think we've got a, a land of enchantment, and I think that's probably the best term for New Mexico, because once you see one of our sunrises and once you see one of our sunsets, you're hooked. At least that's my opinion. 
Thank you, Kayla. I've got um, another question from Michelle when okay. you when you're ready. Well, let's throw it out there. Yeah. Let's do the audio thing first. Okay. Sorry, gotta do the audio thing first. Before we move to that one, I do want to make a comment on the difference between community and identity and so forth. And I think within any town, which is a geographical place, there are multiple communities. People have church communities, people have business communities, people have a sense of their town's community. Um, they may have social groups that, that are also their community. So it really depends on how people are using that word and what they mean by it. But I think when you're talking about a community in the sense of a geographic place, that um, we tend to find different ways of different things about that town or that community or the geography that's there that binds us and creates that sense of place. And I think that that is critical when we're looking at our town as the community and all of the people that are in it. And um, that is part of our next program. We'll talk about some of that. So we'll get to that at the, the later part of this program. But I just wanted to throw that out there. We have lots of communities within our geographic community. Wonderful. Michelle's question is very similar to what you just said. Uh, what are the factors that make up a community or what would one consider a healthy community? Anyone? Anyone want to take a stab at that one? I think one of the earmarks of a healthy community is a place where you can raise your children, they get a great education, and they can find jobs without having to go to the big cities. <laughs> raise kids manage to do that. Mine are both in the city. So it, uh, but I think the more, the more we grow and maintain our, our healthy community and beautiful lifestyle, uh, the more employment opportunities we'll have for our kids. I think that's true. I wanna, do we have anybody else online before I jump to the next thing? Michelle says thank you. Okay. So inside the program, we have a few Edgewood fun facts. I thought this would be a good transition to our next topic. Um, Rita Loy already answered the first one, what was the original town name and it was Venus. And why the name changed was because of the post office situation. Um, Cherry, Hill, Cherry Cider Hill was a popular landmark that many people knew Edgewood by when they traveled on Route 66 way back in the day. Does anybody know where that was? Rita Loy? You, I said the Cherry Cider Hill, where was that in Edgewood? <laughs> I'll bet you Rita Loy's probably actually had a drink there. Yes, Cherry Cider Hill. As, as you leave Edgewood and start up the hill and start dropping down on the left-hand side, the rock is pretty well exposed. But there was a dwelling there that the Adams family had. And they sold Cherry Cider. That was their big thing to get them through the Depression and then on into the future. We still have Kenny Adams around town. And uh, uh, he let me know one time that his family name isn't really Adams, but he wouldn't tell me exactly why or where the family really came from. Part, his mother was from the, a local family though. And, um, uh, so if you want to know about the Adams family, they are a lovely group. The road name significance is, is certainly has to do with the homestead families for the most part. Um, my, my dad and his family were all born in the same house on Frost Road. And as I said, the post office was several miles away. So... Edgewood was incorporated in 1999, and the election tie was broken by a, a poker draw, and Howard Calkins won. Actually, Edgewood's had a couple of ties broken by a draw of a high card. Howard's draw of a high card was uh, for the mayorship. That was the second time it was done. The very first time it was done was Edgewood's first election in 1999, and the winner was Gary Chemistruck with a seven of hearts, I think it was. 
uh, that was the high card drawn. And it was a three-way tie. <laughs> and, uh, and so Edgewood has a lot of history of that. And we honor that history. We just did uh, with our incoming commission. And they had to draw for how long their terms were because all five positions were elected in this past cycle. So they had to determine who had two-year terms and who had four-year terms. And they used the draw of the high card to determine. And the two that drew the high cards got the four years and the rest got two years. So Edgewood has a history with that. And we like to, I guess we like some of our traditions here. Um, the old 101 motel, does anybody know where that was? What? No, no, this was in Edgewood and the building still stands, believe it or not, barely, but it still stands. Okay, so the old 101 motel is where Hug a Horse Thrift Shop originally started, where um, the Radio Shack used to be many years ago. Well, if you did it, <laughs> I didn't know that. So, you know, it's kind of fun if you look at the building, especially if you look at from the corner over by where O'Reilly's is and you look at the building that way, you can see all the doors and windows and it looks like a motel. Yeah, we have lots of stores that everybody knew. It used to be in Edgewood that to give directions, we didn't have a single traffic light in town until about 1999, 2000, right around there. Um, and people used to give directions by saying, go to the four-way stop. And that meant you were at New Mexico 344 and Highway Route 66. So <laughs> go figure, small town stuff. So Edgewoodisms is kind of the next thing on our agenda. And this is really colloquialisms or habits or sayings that we use in this town that newcomers have found a little puzzling. <laughs> and Andrea and I both saw this post on Facebook where a newcomer had asked, why do people in Edgewood say they're going to town when they mean they're going to Albuquerque? And as best as we could, people who have been here a long time tried to answer that question. <laughs> But I'll maybe pass the microphone to some of you that have been here a little while and you can tell people why that is. So why do people say they're going to town when they mean Albuquerque? Well, I'm not 100% sure, but we finally incorporated and became a town. And before that, there was no town meant nothing but Albuquerque. So I'm sure it was a continuation of that habit because we've only been a town 20 years. So I was hoping we would have some newcomers here that might be able to tell us other things that they've noticed. Do we have anyone online? So the other thing, and other people have referred to this today too, is uh, when we're driving down the road, we all tend to wave. You see your hand come off the steering wheel and we wave as we pass each other. Um, and a lot of newcomers are like, what's that all about? Am I supposed to stop? <laughs> I, yeah, I would, if you don't mind, I'll weigh in there. Um, when we first came here probably in the 90s. Um, I would play with the, they were putting in a couple of new houses in, in our neighborhood and I would play with the contractor's sons. And so that was kind of my introduction to New Mexico culture or some of the colloquialisms. And uh, some of them, uh, some of the things that I noticed were they would refer to soda as cokes all the all the sodas were coke everything was coke and i was like eh? <laughs> but you know you get used to that and a lot of the things that uh the kids would also say is um all she was all like this or all that and it was very confusing to me and then i caught myself adopting that language and those mannerisms too at the more i hung out with them and it was really neat to kind of get that kind of introduction to, um, you know, the cool, what's the cool thing to kind of integrate yourself into the community. And um, I can't remember any other things, but there was a campaign long ago uh, by the New Mexico State Fair. There was, uh, it was, I can't remember who the spokesperson was, but she was uh, a Bur Burkes, is that what it was? Anyway. There were some funny things on there that I recognized. Um, another thing that I thought was uh, pretty neat was there was someone who I would give, give rides to and from work when I used to work at Los Vecinos Community Center in Terrace. 
my coworker, I'd give her rides and she would say, you want me to put gas? And I didn't realize what that meant until she wanted to give me money to refill my tank. But I, I really like, I really like that. I really like all the neat little sayings and colloquialisms for things. It just really, you just feel real at home. Um, and I think um, you don't see those little gems until you're new. And I think that's pretty neat. I don't know if anybody else noticed anything. I worked in town for 18 years and I would park in the parking lot where my work was. And of course, in wintertime, you could tell where I had parked because I left mud and snow and ice and water and a few other things in my parking place. And I would look around and I would see another parking place with mud and snow on it and say, ah, there's a mountain car. Somebody lives in the mountains. And I think that, <laughs> and I see a, you know, a, a mud covered truck. Oh, that's a mountain guy. <laughs> okay, we have an online person. This is from Evelyn. Uh, she says uh, that's similar to living in San Jose. And when we would go to San Francisco, we would say we were going to the city. And, I, and I'll just add in New York City, there are five boroughs, Manhattan being one, but all of the outer boroughs say that men, they're going to the city when they go to Manhattan, even though they are all in New York City. So, And I've lived all over the country, but I've never lived in the South. And so when I moved to New Mexico, I did not expect to hear the term y'all. But we hear that a lot out here. Um, I don't know if it's a carryover from Texans that have moved here or if it's just a longstanding New Mexico thing. Okay, Ray takes full responsibility for that bad habit. <laughs> it's a Southern thing. And I know a lot of Edgewood original homesteading families came from like Missouri and the Midwest area. So we'll, we'll see a lot of that in our family when you look back in the family trees of the families that have been here. I know when we first moved here, my kids ranged in age from about eighth grade to not even in school yet. And my oldest daughter who had grown up um, until eighth grade in the, eighth, in the um, suburbs of the Los Angeles area, she said to me one day, she came home from school very disturbed and upset. And she said, people keep staring at me, mom, people keep staring at me. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, I, everywhere I go, people stare at me. And I thought, well, you're new and it's a small town and maybe they're trying to figure out who you are. Just say hi. And she goes, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. She goes, even grownups. So I said, all right, well, next time it happens, let me know. So we were at Smith's later in the afternoon, walking down the aisle, pushing our cart. And she goes, see, see, that guy just did it. And I said, he was making eye contact, honey, and just being friendly. <laughs> But there's a big difference between the big city and a small town where people don't have to know you to be friendly in a small town. They just tend to be. And they say hi, whether they know you or not. And I think that's one of the things that people tend to fall in love with, with Edgewood. I think I, I remembered one other thing, and this is probably just statewide, but Christmas. <laughs> I didn't yeah, know what of course. Christmas meant when I was ordering food and I just love New Mexican cuisine. It's just, you can't find it anywhere else. And that I didn't understand what Christmas was. And then I got Christmas and whoo wee, that was a good Christmas. But no turning back. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. That I had never experienced the type of flavors that we have here. Um, and I, I don't, I just love New Mexican cuisine. It's very, very good. And it's just kind of a mish, mishmash of a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that. It has so many different origins and I really love it. And I know that Colorado, it's so quaint that they think they have great green chili. But, um, <laughs> you know, when I moved from Edgewood, the next place I went was Durango. And just going over that state line by 30 miles, man, the food changes. You cannot get good carne out of to save your life. And all you do is hope for your next trip south <laughs> so that you can get some good food. Not that they don't have good food in Durango. It's just not New Mexican food. Did we have anybody else who wanted to weigh in, uh, either in person or virtually? I'll just say that goes for a lot of burger, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ray? Okay, Ray. This has to do with chili. Uh, 
I knew a gentleman, a guy named J.B. Duke, who was a builder and, you know, a fairly substantial builder in Albuquerque. And he and I went on a quail hunting trip one time. And we went to Nara Visa on the Texas line. And we stopped at a restaurant. And I was thinking of ordering Mexican food or New Mexican food. And he said, don't. He said, I got to give you a rule of thumb when you live here. Never order chili if you're more than 50 miles away from the Rio Grande. <laughs> that is sage advice <laughs> so i thought what we might do now is kind of go over some of the common themes we've seen today and um if anybody has any others to add to it as we go through andrea has been diligently taking notes and has put some of them up on the whiteboards for us so you want to go through this part andrea Yes, sure. So um, as we were uh, talking and uh, people were contributing their own stories, there were some kind of overriding themes. And I'm wondering, are these uh, values um, something that we have in common? And is this a way that we can find some commonality, some common ground and be able to interact with one another, um, you know, in a, a peaceful, respectful way? And I think um, when Michelle talked about community, maybe we didn't realize that we do have more in common than we think. Um, it, it seems like between long timers and newcomers, the rural, appeal, the rural appeal, I cannot say rural to save my life, obviously, <laughs> um, it seemed like a big, a big plus, a big check mark. Um, and it really seems like people want a different quality of life. Um, and the thing that really uh, struck out, uh, stuck out to me was um, the looking for opportunity earlier on uh, when people came here and they came from agricultural families. And it seems when Linda, you shared your um, uh, story about how you came here looking for opportunities for your family, educational opportunities. And then I really liked uh, how we did address why people leave sometimes when Bonnie weighed in about restlessness for new experiences. Um, she felt disenfranchised when she left. And um, now she's returned. Uh, she had, when we talked earlier, she said she returned for um, other things be, beyond family, but family is what you stayed for. And uh, those seem like very important qualities to both sides of the coin. And I really liked what KR had to say about the potential. And I noticed that a lot of people um, commented how they really relocated here for the potential. Um, and I, I really liked that aspect of it. So I'm, I'm wondering if we might be able to use these commonalities to segue in to the next event or next program or next forum um, that will be happening on a March 19th, correct? 19th, yeah. And um, I'm wondering how can we come together on those commonalities to create a vision for our future. And um, I didn't know if you um, wanted to weigh in on that a little bit. Well, I do wanna say that yes. even though we titled this program, Old Roots and New Roots, um, it really wasn't intended to say that there's any kind of a divide between long timers and newcomers yes. in our town. It really was to say we have different experiences and we wanted to be able to draw those experiences out and talk about those common and, and to see the commonalities really that brought us here. At some point, everybody came here or chose to stay here. Rita Loy was born not in this town, but lived here since she was a tiny toddler infant. Um, and there's something that has kept her here. And um, you know, for many, many years, you guys did not grow up here, but you have stayed here for many, many years. So I just think it's very interesting. And it's it's the same qualities, I think that have that people have found our town and either lived here a long time or are newly finding our town and have chosen to put down some roots here and see what it's like. So it's a lot of fun to kind of hear these stories and hear the different perspectives um, 
of that. I know for me, one of the things that enchanted me when I was sitting in Los Angeles looking at New Mexico about the East Mountain region was I had subscribed to what used to be the East Mountain Telegraph and is no more. Um, but there was a, a story about cows loose on 217. This is a common theme out here. It's, it's <laughs> this happens a lot. And but what I laughed at was that the Torrance County Sheriff's Department was noted as having a lot of former Wranglers on their staff, and they just sent them out to round up the cows and get them back in the fence behind the fence. And I thought that's pretty cool. I want to live in a community that's like that, where people just help each other, where they get involved, they, you know, uh, do things. And I do think that Edgewood is very much that kind of a place. And um, I think we have a lot of opportunities as a town that maybe unincorporated places don't have. And so I think it's great. And I do think that that's part of what brings people here. Of course, our retail shopping doesn't hurt. We are kind of the hub of the East Mountains when it comes to that. Um, but I just think it's kind of fun. And that is part of what we want to do next time in March is to talk about so we know a little bit now about our past. We know a little bit more about our present. Where we want to go in our future? What do we want? You know, it's the age old question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, for a town, that's a little bit harder to define because it's a lot of different minds coming together to say, well, this is what we value here. This is what we appreciate that's here that we don't want to lose. But there's always somebody saying, you know, a good steakhouse would be good. <laughs> I hear calls for Chipotle all the time. Um, and, you know, people like variety too. So how do we find that balance? And I think that's what we hope to discover and talk about next month on March 19th is some of those visions that we have for what our community can be like going forward. And I think I saw uh, someone posting something on the chat. Did you want to? Sure, this is a, a question from Meredith. The overarching theme of this project is creating a more perfect union in advance of this of celebrating the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. What ways can you recommend for the country to overcome the political, social, ethnic, and economic tensions? There's a big question to end on. How many days do we have for that one? <laughs> I think we can end it for I'm yeah, I think we're doing it right now. Right? Yeah. We're doing it right now. A uh, part of being a democratic society is having a voice, being able to freely say what you want to say. And um, I think having respectful discourse like we're doing now is good. And listening. New Mexico listens. <laughs> Good plug, Andrea. Yeah, that's what we're no, doing. We're I, and I do think that that is part of it. I think having open conversation, open dialogue, and so forth. I'm going to pass the mic to Ray. Yes, sorry. You know, I, I think we're overlooking one thing, and it's great for all of us to get together on common ground. I believe that. But one of the things that you need to know about Edgewood, okay, Edgewood is incorporated because it wanted to get out of Santa Fe County, okay? The people that live in Edgewood are a great deal different, both politically and socially, okay, than the folks in Santa Fe, which seems to control the county government, all right? Most of the people, you know, the population center is there. So folks in Edgewood were, are pretty independent. They moved to the country to live on larger lots and, be self-contained. They don't look to the government for much, okay? And we actually seceded from Santa Fe County, became our own town, because that was the best way to do it. We gave thoughts to becoming another county because we're quite different. And we see that uh, those differences are important because the governments in Santa Fe and Santa Fe County never listened to us, didn't supply services didn't care about us at all. So a bunch of us got together and led a, um, you know, a march to become our own town. And I'm much more comfortable becoming our own town because I think we're much more representative here now of the general population of the Southern part of the County. We are not the same as Santa Fe. Uh, there are people that get upset bad <laughs> when you say, oh, we're just Santa Fe and we're all the same. We are not. 
Okay. And we're kind of loving what we have. And we've had our blips and things, but we've been in town 20 years now. And I think we're doing a good job of it. Um, our land use policies and a lot of other things are quite different in the way we look at them uh, than they do in an urban area. You know, Santa Fe, one of its problems, it's urban. We are not. Um, the other way is that, uh, you know, politically and more conservative down here, I'd say. But, but there is a big difference, and that's why we're a town, and I think that was a very good way to go because it's working for us. So maybe forming a perfect union means finding the perfect place for you, not everything being all the same vanilla. Um, I, think, I think that is part of Edgewood's history is to saying we're different. I'm going to echo what you said, but I want to thank you for that comment because the questioner was talking about celebrating the anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And I tip my hat to you, Edgewood, because you know exactly what that means. You founded your own town. You, were, you didn't mean to attack somebody else by doing someone, that kind of thing. But what you've done is kind of a version of the Declaration of Independence that founded the country. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> that was sort of a battle cry. <laughs> so that, uh, does anyone else have anything? Do we have any more online people, comments? Anyone else? Really like. To the old timers, you, you have to say, well, I'm new here and I would like to be here. To the newcomers, I'd like to say, you can't shut the gate behind you, though. <laughs> that is a common issue here, is Edgewood. We have people that come, newcomers, that immediately say, this is perfect just the way it is. We don't want to change anything. Don't let anybody else in. But if the people that came before us had done that, none of us would be here. So... It is important, and that's why we want to have the conversation next month to talk about how we see moving forward as a community in our town and so forth. So that's March 19th. Mark your calendars. We also have um, some evaluation forms if you're here in person. Sorry. And online. So you have a paper copy if you're here in the room. And if you're online, you can find the evaluation form through whatever medium you found this program, either through Facebook or um, on the town's website, on yes. the calendar. Yes, the town calendar. I've posted it under the uh, event, today's event. You can find a link to the survey um, and then other various places on the Facebook event and under the library web pages as well. Mm -hmm. um, Town of Edgewood website is www.edgewood-nm.gov if you prefer to uh, fill that out online. But we do appreciate any feedback that you have to mm -hmm. offer, positive or negative. It'll help us um, with our future programs and events. And we really wanna thank you, all of you, online, in person, um, thank you so much for giving us your story, giving us your time, and you are all very valuable and your experiences are very valuable to this project. Mm -hmm. And we really, really hope to see you again next time. And we're excited. Bring your friends with you. Bring your we friends. really want a big community conversation. Um, just so you know, there'll probably be donuts again next time. So <laughs> if that influences your decision, uh, we'd love to have you. Yeah, we'll feed you in Edgewood. That should be our motto. <laughs> <laughs> so and gonna... Irene, did you have something you wanted? Do you want to close us out, Irene? Yes, please. Um, I really, I forgot I had it on. Look what a trained person I am. Um, I just wanted to say thank you from New Mexico Listens. This is our third event and it has been a highlight. I appreciate, and I know that Rakan appreciates, Goyo, it's, You've been amazing today. The, the things that we've heard from the longtime residents, maybe next time we'll hear more of the appreciation, the appreciation of the people who are new, but you are so candid and so knowledgeable. It's been a privilege. Thank you very much. I'm very glad 
that I met Linda on the telephone some months ago and got to know you a little bit in Edgewood. You have something special going on here. Thank you from New Mexico Listens. Thank you. Yay, thank and you. thank you to everyone who came down from Santa Fe today to help us put this on. All the technical stuff would never have happened. We've got a, a participant who drove down from Santa Fe, Bonnie, um, Irene, thank you for that early connection that we made and we started talking about programs. So I appreciate the help and the support and everybody online that participated as well. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you so much to Goyo. Yeah, Goyo. So there's plenty of donuts left in the hallway yes. if you're here in person. Next time those of you online come in person. <laughs>